Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The House Freedom Caucus pushes back against President Biden's $6.8 trillion budget proposal with a proposal of their own. They say it's aimed at shrinking Washington. A bill to declassify intelligence on COVID origins now moves to President Biden's desk. What Biden says about whether he's signing it as a senator exposes China's efforts to block the bill. Iran and Saudi Arabia agreed today to re-establish diplomatic relations after seven years of tensions between them. The deal also represents a major diplomatic victory for China. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis speaks in Iowa just days before former President Trump is scheduled to be there. How well did Iowans accept the governor? The U.S. economy added 311,000 jobs in February. That's according to the Labor Department's data released today. It's a drop from January's blockbuster jobs report that brought 504,000 positions. Even so, February's job numbers were higher than economists predicted. The Federal Reserve has been battling for almost a year to slow the economy and crush the highest inflation in 40 years, but the labor market continues to defy those efforts. Meanwhile, lawmakers grilled Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen today over President Biden's budget proposal. In response to that budget, Democrats are defending more government spending, while the House Freedom Caucus unveiled its own plan. Here's NTD's Melina Wisecup with more from Capitol Hill. President Biden's $6.8 trillion budget is an increase of about $0.6 trillion. This includes increases for both defense and non-defense spending, as well as a 10% boost for the Social Security Administration. Democrats expectedly welcoming Biden's plan that he says is also aimed at cutting the deficit. We're dealing with a country that is growing, changing with more demands. How can the government ensure that deficit revenue is raised? Nobody can ensure that. Look at what Donald Trump did. The congressman had just attended a hearing where Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen was being pressed on President Biden's tax and spending plans. Some lawmakers expressing skepticism that Biden's corporate tax hikes would make America more competitive. Here's a look. Answer the question how we're going to hold China accountable. We can't even keep balloons from flying across the United States. How are we going to hold them accountable to the OECD framework? If China is not accountable, we will tax the income of Chinese companies operating in the United States. And this all comes as the clock is ticking for Congress to raise the $31.4 trillion debt ceiling. Republicans expectedly opposing President Biden's proposal are working to enact stricter budget measures. Only in America. Can a president who's increasing the national debt from $31.5 trillion to $49 trillion, can he come out and the media say, we're reducing the national debt? <laughs> Democrats have repeatedly pinned Republicans for not unveiling an official budget plan. And while this is true, McCarthy says he plans to work with President Biden on the budget. And now the House Freedom Caucus has unveiled its own budget meant to cut money from government agencies. We rescind all unobligated COVID-19 funds. We recoup the $80 billion in IRS expansion funds. And we recoup billions of dollars of wasteful climate change spending in the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. And this proposal does carry some weight because remember, this is the same group that opposed McCarthy's speakership back in January to force certain budget mechanisms and House rules to be enacted. So it is important to note the significant amount of leverage that this group will have in influencing Speaker McCarthy's budget proposal. Representative Perry tells me that he doesn't believe McCarthy will be opposed to this plan that the Freedom Caucus has laid out. And a senior staffer with the House Freedom Caucus tells in TD. The plan is the path forward for getting 218 Republican votes in the House. So we will likely see this proposal playing a big role in the House GOP's official budget proposal. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And Yellen also told lawmakers today that she's monitoring the situation with the Silicon Valley Bank, or SVB. SVB collapsed this morning after depositors started pulling their money out. A federal agency, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, 
has taken control of the bank to protect customers from losing all their money. It's the largest bank failure since the financial crisis. The sudden collapse prompted the global banking sector to shed billions in market value. The FDIC said the bank will reopen on Monday and all insured depositors will have full access to their insured deposits no later than Monday morning. And the House today unanimously passed a bill to declassify intelligence on the origins of COVID-19. And President Biden now has to make the decision to either sign or veto it. NTD's Iris Tao has more. A rare bipartisan moment on the Hill as the House unanimously passed a bill today to declassify all intelligence on COVID origins. The yeas are 419 and the nays are zero. The 419 to zero vote now sends the bill, which has been passed by the Senate, directly to President Biden's desk. And President Biden says he has not yet decided on whether or not to sign the bill. And the White House seeks to defend Biden's record on information sharing, saying he directed the intelligence community to declassify a relevant report in 2021. We will continue to use every tool to figure out what happened here uh, while also protecting uh, classified information. Again, we're going to take a look at the bill. I just don't have anything to share on how we're going to move forward at this time. The latest push for transparency comes after both the FBI and the Energy Department concluded that the COVID virus most likely leaked from a lab in Wuhan, China. And if Biden signs it, the bill would declassify intelligence about the potential links between the Wuhan lab and the COVID-19 pandemic. But as the U.S. ramps up its efforts to dig into the COVID origin, a Chinese official from China's embassy here in Washington sent a letter to Senator Josh Hawley asking him to drop the bill and accusing the U.S. of undermining international solidarity by its probes into the COVID origin. But Senator Josh Hawley fired back on Friday by sending a letter to China's Xi Jinping, warning him that this bill will soon become law and telling him it's time to, quote, come clean about your role in spreading COVID to the world. And the White House says it'll get back to us after its team examines the COVID origin bill. Reporting from the White House, Aris Tao, NTD News. Iran and Saudi Arabia announced today that they have resumed diplomatic relations. This comes after secret talks mediated by China. An expert says China's involvement is significant. NTD's Arlene Richards reports. After years of tension over the war in Yemen, Saudi Arabia and Iran announced on Friday that they will resume diplomatic relations. But what's even more significant is China's involvement in mediating the deal. This is, uh, very simply put, this is a Chinese move to uh, demonstrate that they're really uh, the world leaders that can bring countries together that are diametrically opposed. China expert John Mills said he was shocked because these two countries have been mortal enemies. He said their agreement shows the ineffectiveness of President Biden. I mean, he's been uh, totally, totally um, over the top unfriendly toward the Saudis. So the Saudis are naturally going to seek other uh, other other superpowers to uh, 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 work with. Saudi Arabia is the world's top oil exporter. Mill said the United States has disliked Saudi Arabia since the Obama years, but he doesn't know why. Now China is a major player. So how is China looking to benefit by being a part of this deal and, and developing this relationship with the Middle East? Well, they need the oil desperately. Uh, they're getting it now, but it has to go through um, the Straits of Malacca, uh, uh, Indonesia, and Singapore. It's extremely vulnerable. This secures the land bridge over Afghanistan, which the Biden team messed up also, and uh, the, the pipeline being built from Iran to China. And now they can just... Well, the, Saudi Arabia doesn't even have to ship the oil. Uh, they can just uh, ship, you know, connect to the same pipeline, and uh, it goes straight. Now, now uh, China has uh, energy security. The White House National Security Council is aware of the renewed ties and said they're hopeful this will help to de-escalate tensions in the Middle East. Mill said the White House is seriously misunderstanding how this relationship affects Americans. For Americans watching this who don't quite understand how international relations affect them uh, on a personal level, um, can you comment on how this could play out and affect Americans at some point in the future? 
the problem is when China is now the dominant partner for Iran uh, and uh, Saudi, that begins to squeeze the Europeans, the South Americans, other Asian countries, and so it increases prices on fossil fuels. So it drives up prices for everybody. It increases uncertainty. It pushes other countries into the Chinese hemisphere, out of our hemisphere, uh, out of our sphere of influence. Meanwhile, White House clean energy czar John Podesta remarked Thursday that Chinese renewable energy companies will play a major role in future U.S. energy production. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis spoke in Iowa just days before former President Trump is scheduled to be there. DeSantis hasn't announced he's running for president yet, but he appears to be laying the groundwork. NTD's Jason Perry has that story. I am so pleased to have the opportunity this morning to introduce and welcome to the great state of Iowa a good friend and a fellow Republican governor, Governor Ron DeSantis. DeSantis spoke in Iowa on Friday to promote his new book, The Courage to Be Free. But before he came out to speak, Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds explained she had much in common with the Florida governor as they were both elected in 2018. Neither one of us could have predicted what was about to come our way in the spring of 2020. With absolutely no playbook, we both focused on protecting the lives and livelihoods and the freedoms of our citizens. And this is also where DeSantis's policy stood out. And I'm just proud to say that when during COVID the world lost its mind, when common sense suddenly became an uncommon virtue, the state of Florida stood as a refuge of sanity. And he said people can now look and see how the COVID policies of Florida and Iowa worked out. So we know now today the elites were wrong about lockdowns. They were wrong about forced masking. They were wrong about closing schools. They were wrong about denying natural immunity. They were wrong about the efficacy of mRNA shots. And they were wrong, and indeed they lied about the lab leak. They said it was uh, natural. We know it came from that lab. He also mentioned a new subject added to the Florida school curriculum. I think we're the only state in the country that does this. We are marked one day a year, November 10th, uh, for students to learn about the evils of communist governments and the victims of communist regimes throughout history. We got to tell the truth about Marxism, Leninism. Although DeSantis has not announced he will run for president, many see this as laying the groundwork. Iowa is a crucial early voting state for Republican presidential campaigns. And DeSantis's trip there comes just a few days before former President Trump will campaign in Iowa. A new Des Moines Register Mediacom Iowa poll shows Iowa Republicans have nearly equal favorable views of Trump and DeSantis. Trump criticized the event on Truth Social, accusing DeSantis of being against farmers, Social Security and Medicare. DeSantis is scheduled to speak in Nevada on Saturday. Jason Perry, NTD News. If you have any news tips or feedback for our show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming next, North Korean defector Yeonmi Park discusses her view of the problems facing America and some of the alarming parallels she says she sees between the U.S. and North Korea. And could the Supreme Court finally weigh in on men who identify as women playing women's sports? NTD's Dave Martin hears from a lawyer who's asking the highest court to weigh in. That and more coming up. Looks like you've been sleeping well. Megan, he's back. The my pillow guy. And you're looking good. I'm still feeling good. Well, just when you thought it couldn't get any better, we've got the best pillow ever, my pillow 2.0. When I invented my pillow, it had everything you'd ever want in a pillow. Well, now there's new technology that makes it even better. My pillow 2.0 has my patented fill combined with a cooling fabric with temperature regulating thread. My pillow 2.0 is truly the next generation of my pillow. The best sleep just got even better. Whether you have a MyPillow or not, you need to get the brand new MyPillow 2.0. Call or go to MyPillow.com now. Use your promo code, and for a limited time when you buy one, you'll get a second one absolutely free. 
You're sleeping even better. And cooler, too. And you're looking good. Feeling good. I knew you would. Visit MyPillow.com. Is America becoming more like North Korea? North Korean defector Yeonmi Park says she's seeing many warning signs. The host of American Thought Leaders, Yanya Kellick, sits down with Park to discuss what she sees as the problems facing America. The tactics that are being used in America right now to control people were the same tactics the North Korean regime used to control us and enslaved us eventually. Yeonmi Park fled North Korea at the age of 13, first to China, then to South Korea, and she eventually came to the United States. But she says the America she saw was not what she had expected. I went to Columbia University, and there I was reminded by a lot of things that I saw in North Korea, what was happening in America. And Americans were not able to recognize those threats the way I could, could because they never lived in truly oppressive country. Park draws comparisons between the control of speech in North Korea and political correctness in America. She argues that in both situations, the ruling elites decide what the truth is. North Korea, the Communist Party, the regime decides what people can talk about or not. If you disagree with the party's line, you get executed. In America currently, if you go against political correctness, you lose your dignity, your character is assassinated, and you lose your livelihood. Park draws another parallel between the political climate in the two countries. So right now there are so many Biden promises that give the students debt forgiveness. The same tactic that Kim Il-sung used to buy the votes to become a dictator eventually. That somehow that we governments keep promising things should, should be free. That's a very dangerous ideology, like nothing is free in the world. You know, when something is free, like me crossing that river to China, this lady somehow helping me for free. What did she do? She sold me into sex slavery. Right. So me us not questioning why something is free, I think that's very scary. Park says a cultural revolution is already taking place in America. She highlights, for example, that ideas such as human rights have already changed meaning in America. What it meant for me is a right to pursue your life in a land where there is no infringement of your speech or your religion or your movement and your thoughts. It wasn't about me demanding the country giving me free education, free health care, free housing, free universal income. It wasn't about my entitlement. Mm. But in America, what it became currently the human rights meant is that my feelings rise over facts. So what does she consider some of the factors behind such changes? Happiness only comes when you're grateful. So Americans lost that gratitude. And I think in this culture, almost they demanding you to be a victim. They're asking you to be oppressed and miserable. You can watch the full interview with Yeon Mi Park on American Thought Leaders on EpicTV.com. Britain will pay France nearly half a billion pounds over the next three years to help stop small boats from crossing the English Channel. The money will be used to fund a detention center in France and hire hundreds of extra law enforcement officers on French shores. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak announced the new package during the first UK-France summit in six years. The UK will give France almost £500 million to prevent small boats from crossing the Channel. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak made the announcement after meeting French President Emmanuel Macron on Friday during a UK-France summit in Paris. And today we've taken our cooperation to an unprecedented level to tackle this shared challenge. We're announcing a new detention centre in northern France, a new command centre bringing our enforcement teams together in one place for the first time, and an extra 500 new officers patrolling French beaches, all underpinned by more drones and other surveillance technologies that will help ramp up the interception rate. It's the first time the UK will contribute to building a detention centre in France. But there was no sign of the returns agreement for asylum seekers that the government desires. The UK has already committed more than £300 million to France in the last decade to help tackle illegal migration, including a £63 million package only four months ago. 
Sunak said the migration problem is a global challenge and Britain needs to work with France. I've always been clear there's no one solution to solving this very complicated problem and nor will it be solved overnight. Right, but there's, you know, our new legislation will help and I've always said cooperation with our allies, especially France, is an important part of that. This once regular summit was being held for the first time since 2016. Sunak and Macron chose to hold their talks in private. The gathering is seen as a chapter change in cross-channel relations after Brexit. But I believe today's meeting does mark a new beginning, an entente renewed. We are looking to the future, a future that builds on all that we share, our history, our geography, our values. Macron said the two countries need a fresh start in their relationship. My wish definitely because it's, it makes sense with our history, our geography, our DNA, I would say, is to have the best, I mean, the best possible relation and the closest alliance. But it will depend on our commitment, our willingness. But I'm sure we will do it. Sunak also said Paris and London have signed a new deal on civil nuclear cooperation and agreed to train Ukrainian Marines. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. Thank you, Steph. A former West Virginia women's soccer player has filed a suit against the ACLU to uphold a law that keeps biological males out of women's sports in her state. Lainey Armistead, who played for the Mountaineers until her recent graduation, got involved legally after watching the ACLU oppose West Virginia's Save Women's Sports Act. The act, which was passed in 2021, bans biological males from competing on women's school sports teams. The ACLU is representing a transgender middle school athlete who was barred from joining the girls' cross-country team. They initially lost their appeal in a district court, then they appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals earlier this year and were granted an injunction that essentially pauses the law until their lawsuit is resolved. And they did this without any legal or factual basis, and so we're asking the Supreme Court to uphold West Virginia's law in its entirety. Rachel Satoris is legal counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom, which represents Armistead against the ACLU. She says this law is simply about fairness in women's sports. Recently, activists have really rejected reality and instead chosen ideology over what's good and right for women and girls. And this is pervasive across the country. Uh, we have girls losing out on podium spots, on um, public recognition, on the chance to compete for scholarships, and really the chance to even have an opportunity to compete in women's sports when males take their spot. Should the Supreme Court hear their case, it will be the first time they rule on the issue of transgender sports. Sutura so says should they hear it, they would simply have to uphold Title IX, which prohibits schools from discriminating based on sex and was enacted to ensure equal opportunities for women in sports. That's just common sense, that males are bigger, faster, and stronger than females, and they shouldn't be allowed um, to take women's opportunities, which was the reason that Title IX was created. Meanwhile, Armistead, who's now attending law school, credits Title IX for her athletic scholarship. And for your sports viewing schedule tonight, the NBA has six games on, including one with two of the top three scores in the league, as the Philadelphia 76ers and Joel Embiid, who's tops in the NBA in scoring at just over 33 points a game, host the Portland Trailblazers and Damian Lillard, who's third at just over 32. And in the college game, several top 25 battles are on tonight as UConn plays Marquette, Duke battles Miami, Creighton and Xavier square off, and finally in the Big 12, it's Texas versus Texas Christian. And lastly, for you hockey fans, just two games on as Florida hosts Chicago and Anaheim plays at Calgary. And that's it for your sports news today. Steph, back to you. Thanks, Dave. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Good night.
watching us on YouTube, did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.